let's move it then into the next seat speaker that we have, who is an entrepreneur, very interesting, the bees melody. Um, for those of you who are lovers of Calypso music, you know that this is a, um, a classic from Lord Kitchener, bees melody. And the gentleman that we're going to ask to um, share with us at this point is, is Chunilal Ramnarayan, who's had a very interesting story which he will share from us, coming from the 4-H um, system right through to his full-blown entrepreneurial, um, uh, his, his enterprise um, in the apiaries, in the bee, bee making and, and everything that comes. So please welcome Chunilal. Thank you very much. Uh, just one uh, correction: uh, it is Rupnarain. It's not a problem. I get it every day. Um, I, I just sorry that um, I couldn't, if there was a way of trading some of my time for the full speaker, I would have done it because it's so interesting and um, actually caught my full attention. So it, it's so imparting exactly what we do for our life. Lives. And um, there's no way it is very strange whatsoever. I'm going to take a slight different slant, even though it's, it's impacted us heavily. Starting from a slight different slant, like uh, Joseph mentioned, it's come from the point. And uh, I started my career in beekeeping from the age of nine, introduced to beekeeping at that point, where um, I was a forager. What we call the Forage and Young Farmers Club existed in Trinidad those days. It's all over the world. And I think they're trying to get it back on the ground now. Uh, it wasn't hard for me to be a forager because my mom was a forager, so she understands the interest in the whole business. And therefore, being an agricultural base area, we were easily accepted into and have the encouragement from at home. And I think that's one of the areas that we need to look into in the near future, even now that we need to encourage our children to get back into the area of agriculture, regardless of what area it is, if we need to really have food security in any, uh, in, in any way whatsoever. Because we have too many people moving out of the agricultural sector and going to other areas. So, having been a forager for some time, um, you know, in, in your youth, what happens is that you actually they plant things in children at a very young stage. They can still inside of you and it stays with you. And no matter where you go, that remains post impression of people. So it stays with you. So even though I have I've led myself to different areas in, in, in the industry, in electrical, etc., and so on, it remained with me. And uh, I, I took all of the, the funds that I work with and I said, Look, I need to get back into agriculture. And where should I go? And uh, doing my feasibility studies, I realized, hi, beekeeping is it, because at the point in time, it was 15 years ago, when I looked at it, I realized Trinidad was only supplying 10% of the honey we need locally, only 10%. So I said, listen, it's not a fight for product cities. There's your market, go for that. So I had myself re specialized again into the field and dive into the apiculture sector. So having moved into the apiculture sector, in Trinidad, I realized after getting in there as a beekeeper, it was so vague that all people know honey, beekeepers for his honey, full stop. So we had a beekeeper, we get good honey from and that's it, full stop. There was nothing more people knew in Trinidad at a point in time that concerns beekeepers but just honey and these things. That's all. Honey and these things, and these things can kill you. That's all they knew. So I, with my, you know, my passion for beekeeping, and my passion for doing whatever I do, I'm doing, I like to do it in the right way. I like to get into the depth of it. So I started to educate myself, went into the depth of the keeping, started from way below, and within five years period, worked myself into forming what we now know as the Association of Professional Beekeepers. Okay? We met in place the Tobago Apiculture Society, and the Trinidad and Tobago Beekeepers Association. Today we are number one. But that's, that's just where it is. Because of the fact that I was able, um, being the president of the association from that time to now, um, also attained the, the title as the treasurer of the Caribbean Beekeepers Association at this present time. So I'm, I'm moving out. 
and trying to foster the other two organizations to develop the beekeeping sector was not an easy job for me. There were so many elders literally, <laughs> literally abusing me, asking me how foolish you are. You have just come into this thing, and do you think you can change this overnight? Your mad person. This could never be achievable. We have been here. I've been told that by government officers. We have been here long years. We haven't changed it. Could you change it? That could never happen. Today, I'm surprised to see that some of the same government officers is asking me to lobby for them. It's all about doing what you do in the right way. It's all about putting all you got into it. And if we need to really develop our food system in this country, we must not be talking about it. We must be taking firm actions about it. We must be doing what we're supposed to do in the right way, understanding it properly. But that doesn't be the same thing all the time we talk about. However, let me move on. I don't want to get into the politics of it. At that point in time, I started to do some research and realized that in 1947, just to take you back with some history, that we exported 238,934 pounds of honey. Okay? Last data collected by myself and colleagues of the ministry, 2008. 35,423 million pounds. How is that? It shows that even probably at that time, maybe about, my estimation was about 8% of the money in the world. We're producing it around over 100%. You should imagine what's happening. We are going down. Presently, we have an approximate 300 beekeepers, 6,000 colonies. They can share them. But that is the reality of it. We are hit by several things. Urbanization, industrialization, non-funding, and so on. And that is why the first speaker have, have really, really, really touched a great part of it. Because the global situation adds to it. And where we is right now, there is no honey really in this country. That's the facts. I've done my research just about five days ago, and if I had, if I had caught any beekeeper having anything more than four to five gallons of honey in his possession, that's a lot. Global, whether it's warming or whether it's the El but we are having heavy rain season in our dry seasons, and that impact is very heavy on the industry. But it's not about honey, folks. It's not about honey. It's not about our money is being lost. It's about the pollination of trees that has been dropped. And when that happens, the food becomes scarce. Right, for I'm It's not about we not getting on in the dry season. Because remember, trees, flowers, under stress when there is an extreme sun in the dry season. So, the sense that few more of these died, they could lose their lives, etc., they are sensitive. So, they produce food. They produce foods. And by doing so, they have to flower. Then the bees will go and pollinate. So that you get offsprings coming, should there be deaths. But when there is no weather conditions in place to allow bees to come and pollinate because there are no flowers on these trees, then the food is dropping. It's getting lower and lower. That's where we are heading for. Very frightening stage. One scientist recently published that um, if bees should go extinct, we have four more years to live in terms of food. Very frightening stage. So we all have to be mindful of these things. At present, the Association of Professional Beekeepers, we have taken the initiative to start enlightening the public as to the benefits of beekeeping in terms of pollination, where it would help us in adding extra food on our table or markets, etc. And trying to get the public to understand what we are doing. We have successfully launched things like honey exhibition, honey shows, and uh, bringing out the real value into beekeeping, 
where, as I said many years ago, all people knew was honey for bees for honey and these things. As I have a table here, you try and get a good look of it because I'm not going to be here all day. We have two more sessions to do after being here, so we have to cut here short and move. We have a range of value-added products attached to beekeeping. And you will be surprised to see that there are soaps on that table, there are hair foods on that table, there are skin creams on that table, and so on. There is. People never know that. And why put honey on in, in products like that and so on? People never know. All they use honey for is a little common cold. Folks, I tell people, brave and bold, don't buy food that food at home. It's poisonous. You can't drink it. The children get sick, it kills them. Buy honey. Cut, bruise, burn, rashes. Do you want it? It's natural. It is. It is all prepared for us by our grandmas. Our life is all. Why buy products that are very synthetic, damage it to your body, and it makes good products? And when you use good products, you really support your beekeeping sector and you really support your food. Because these bees that produce these stuff pollinate your food. So you encourage the whole thing. So that is wonderful. Sure, some of us haven't realized that until now. So, what we have been doing, as I said, is educating the public on the products, on the uses of the products, and so forth. Not an easy road. It's not an easy road, believe me. I've been to the Permanent Secretary five days ago asking the Permanent Secretary that we are beekeepers are having problems in this country and we need to get the apiculture sector back on this move and to be exact the APVC unit because they have dismantled the unit in 1978 just after one year before the Africanized bees came to Trinidad and 90% of our beekeepers had no training to it and there was no training available to them so they just left it and run because it was bees killing everybody. So beekeepers just left that and run, very few remain, and the ministry had nothing to that we can go train these new beekeepers to say, well, listen, let's send some people to Brazil, find out where this thing came from and what we could do about it. So it just went down. And then the other year, instead of they encourage it, it shut down the APVC. So you understand why our food are getting scarce? Pollination, we're depending on bees and the wild, and the bees and the wild are dying because they kill it on a daily basis. You call the apiaries unit, what is known as the apiaries unit, and they send a gentleman there with a spray can and they shoot it up. Those are the bees we depend on to fall into our crops. So we are diminishing the safety to food. We are diminishing everything. So I was talking to this permanent secretary five or six days ago and I said, listen, madam, we need to get this unit back in place. And she's saying there is, and I said, no, there is none. And yes, there is. And I keep going back for about 15 minutes. <laughs> So I said, yes, you are right. There is a unit. You call the telephone directory and you call the number and there is a unit and the person answer the phone the next time and say, yes, we send a person to kill the bees immediately. That's where it is. The unit is comprised of seven to eight beekeeping officers in every county and there is none. There is a unit by name. She took two and a half years. No ministry to understand. Five years. So that's where we act. And if we are a nation looking to head up in front of us and just put security of food to the forefront, we in bad shape. So we don't even know what's happening in our own country. We as a people need to understand this. So we need to take steps. And as the first speaker said, is that there's so much of things put in place, so much of people talking, who is willing to do it? Who is willing to do it? So we are, we are trying our best. We get a lot of blows for it. We take it on a daily basis. And we try our best to do what we have to do. So in, in, in coming to uh, having the association doing all these things, we get involved with the ministry, seeing the problems that are available. That the ministry has nothing as a real tutor in plan. You know, they have a nice pretty, they have a nice pretty crash course where they send you in for five days and you come back out knowing very little about it. All your things. So the association says no, no to that, and we have put in place a program over six months where we train people for a period of six months. So when you come out here, we did a class last year, we had 22 people in it, 18 are now producing money. 
and value of products. Pollen, getting to a lot of pollen that has never been sold in this country for many years ago. We bring pollen from China and Japan. All, all the Asian countries to give you a problem to have local fresh pollen in Trinidad. Royal jelly, locally fresh produce. Okay? Propolis, locally fresh produce. No longer coming from the Asian countries. You have it fresh here. That is what we have been able to achieve in a so as an association. <laughs> it's not an easy job, as I said. It's not an easy job. Having seen what is happening, the, it, the, as I said, there's no APVs unit, so there's no uh, start of colonies, what we call start of colonies or beginner colonies. Uh, with just three frames and a lane queen, so that new beekeepers who you train would get started colonies to move on. The ministry has four APERI units, um, APERI's offices, with sites, all grown into large forest trees, etc. No colonies. That's all they have. So, again, as an association collaborating with the Agricultural Society of Trinidad and Tobago, we have decided that we're going to launch a project where we have put in place a new glide project, the Queen Road project. A very amazing project. We, we started off this project with a sum of $75,000. Not a cent was given to us by any bank or any institution. Members of the association have funded it. But we saw the need for it. We did it. We did it. We supply new guys today. Two big, key, two big keepers in this country were subsidized business, additive to what we have contributed for our research. And the beekeeper is only allowed to pay $200 where the initial cost would have been five million. The agriculture society will offset the other three million. So we collect that money and just reproduce the small stipend to the people who work on the project in our bid to get the beekeeping sector go because we understand what's going to happen to food in the near years coming. We understand what's going on. We, as beekeepers, we see that. Where others doesn't see, we see that we understand the reality. And hence the reason why I keep running back to the first speaker. You know, he was so, so, so true to what he was saying. That's the reality of it. So, that is where we are at the present, running this massive project. It is a massive project because the, the list is huge for supplies. The ministry is in no way close to start that kind of business anymore. Because it doesn't have funding, it doesn't have staffing, and a lot of things is out of place. So I think even though they intend to get into it, which they attempted to a few weeks ago, it's very far from now. And if the next election comes, you know what happens, you can't pick that way out of that. So we are well ahead with this as an association. It's a proud way for the members of the Association of Professional Beekeepers to achieve. Um, as an individual, Having moved from 4-H to associations, etc., I've been able to, to, to give a birth to my beekeeping business known as Nature's Best Apiaries, where we also joined with the ministry in training people, tutoring them, value-added products in this country. Again, I've been hit real hard for that. I'm not ashamed to say that people would actually call me in the past and say, are you stupid? You're going to teach people to make food, um, skin creams, and soaps, whatever, not. All these people are going to come and sell the same thing, so they're going to knock you off the business. Well, that is so wrong. When I did, what do you do? If God takes me any money, what's going to happen? If you want a plan for succession planning, where is this? You don't sleep with it in your brain. You teach people, and you get it across the board. That's what it is. So I boldly and bravely done it. Keep doing it. And we'll continue to do it until I'm proud. One of the gentlemen here on the table with me is Pastor Anthony Bonin. Four years ago, I met this gentleman on a meeting. And today, he exports pollen from Trinidad and Tobago to any part of the Caribbean at present. <laughs> that is where it has, what is what it, that is the reason it has done to me. And I can see people coming off from what I do. That's passion, and that's what's happening. Okay? So, personally, I have done well. I in, in, in trying to get my information outside here to people. And having done so, this is where it has 
at this point. I would ask each one of you to try and get on to us before we leave and find out what there is on that table and what there is in it for you. Because today we have grown accustomed to using <coughs> synthetic materials for our skin, internal use, and it damages us instead of us. You have products that is available to you. You have stuff there to purchase. You have products there that could be purchased today as well, um, which you can do when we break for lunch, which will be coming up after our next seat speaker, Sam Dollar. But before Chunilal um, leaves up front here, are there any questions? Any comments from anyone? Or maybe I would, yeah? Um, where are those um, products available at for purchase? Okay, we are now on the verge of seeking new markets in Trinidad where we're going to have it in certain outlets. Uh, apart from that, if you contact us directly, we can have a shuttle straight to your property, home businesses, or whatever. We are already in that business, as I said, Pastor actually sells this product way off the Caribbean. So Trinidad is not too far for us. You can get the information at, uh, at the table there in terms. Very interesting question, and um, we have been trying to get around certain people, and we realize that we've got to do this on our own again, because um, cottage industries do have a share fair share of problems. And I tell you, uh, just very quickly, I'll run with it. You know, if you buy, if you go to the store and you buy a product that has a foreign label, there's no questions asked. You purchase, you place it into your bag, and you move on. You go home and use it. Whether it works for you, there's no just from after. But once there is a local label that is new and straight, and even though Food and Drug and Caribbean has done all the work and make it worse if you know the person, God damn it, how could this be a good product? Because I knew it. And that is some of the problems we have faced in the cottage industry. Not only by myself, but by many other people who have faced this problem. And therefore, we have to look at marketing of local products, especially cottage industry, in a special way, and find some special means of getting the marketing business upside the edge to really get that way. A very uninformed follow-up question. Uh, what kind of certification do you need in Trinidad for your products? Do the, the external products come in, presumably, certified by some agency that has sort of approved them. Do you have a similar approval agency here? I just don't know that. That's why it's an uninformed question. And what is the problem? Okay, we do have food and drugs in front of that. Can we do certification but not for sale? Food and drugs is the people that actually do our certification for sale. But there is a barrage of problems uh, faced with food and drug. Again, I can say that I know people with pet source production and other farmers who have faced some of the problems. Is that I believe that um, I've been saying the food and drug in the past six months, I don't believe they have a standard, really. And that is what gives us the biggest problem. I don't believe they have a standard. If they do have one, it's hidden. Because as, a, as an entrepreneur, when you go to food and drug and you tell them, well, listen, you need to get certification for X product, your label has to be complied with your standards also, and when you meet Officer A on a Monday morning and Officer A tells you this is what they need, you get what they need and you go back to them, and when you reach there you meet Officer B and he says, no, Officer A didn't know what he said, this is what they need. And that keeps going on. So the entrepreneur who has very little money in his pocket, doesn't have a financer behind him, just for short on the roadside, very soon. There goes it. based on the apiary number and label on it. Is that proper or can anybody get this apiary number, put on a label and sell it as honey? 
can that happen? Uh, I've also had a bad experience of getting something else in a bottle that definitely was not honey, hmm. but with a proper label on it, I thought. So can you just clarify what is happening there? No, this is not warm enough. <laughs> Very good question. And um, it's something that I repeat myself on every time we go out and display or do sales or whatever, not on the outside exhibitions and so on. Directly with your question, sir. I say this to members of the public very bold and brave. While being the president of an institution, uh, association, you must comply with certain rules and regulations, and if you cannot, I'm sorry, you're not going to entertain anybody who doesn't work in regulations. So, the proper thing is, a label, honey label, supposed to clearly distinct the name honey, if there is anything else in that honey, the bottle is the label is going to tell you honey and honey. If there is honey alone on that label, then there's supposed to be nothing else inside it. Now, the are big now, I'm going to take a little extra two minutes here to explain it because we're dealing with food. There are beekeepers who would sell your product, that is honey in the bottle, one leg, two wing, maybe a thorax. Tell you this is the real thing, man. That, that's why you see those talking. Excuse me, sir, you're paying for honey, not the leg and wing. Okay? You're paying for honey. You want to see honey. Hygienic standards and bottling, straining, filtering, settling. It must be done properly. So the product must be displayed in the right way. The label, it must be sealed with a flange. It must have a new core. Please don't buy one with a Fernando core. It's not rum and honey. Okay? New forks, new bottles. Proper label. What the label supposed for? What makes it a proper label? The name, the address of the beekeeper, the apiary's number. Now, if you use honey from any beekeeper that carries an apiary number, and you believe that that honey has done ill to your health, your body weights, take that number head for food and drug department, head for the closest agricultural office, and lodge your complaint. In short, they take your complaint up. Because just by the number, we can trace that beekeeper. Just by the number. It means to say, the number tells you that the beekeeper is a registered beekeeper with the Ministry of Food Production in Trinidad and Tobago. If he doesn't have a number, he's not registered. You cannot trace it. Okay? So you must look for those things on your bottle. I haven't any big bottles or small bottles of honey here today, but I walk with a label so that I can show customers what they expect to see on a table. Do not purchase honey on the roadside with all different types of things in it and mark pure honey and it doesn't have a proper label. Folks, you are spending money for a good product, buy a good product. Do not buy those stuff. Yeah. Uh, good question. Um, I mentioned we did some honey shows and exhibitions. In short, um, we have on board Shimmer products, Shimmer Cosmetics, and uh, we, as the Keepers organization, have been working <coughs> not only with information in terms of what products we'd like to see on the market, but even the raw materials. <coughs> and I can vouch for Shimmer products that if you purchase some of our products, you will get natural beeswax as an emulsifier. Instead of using stearic acid, she will now use beeswax used as a natural emulsifier. And there is some honey in her products also. And we are going down that road that they are speaking about because for some of the beekeepers who may not have the finance, we are just trying to get the bigger people on board to do this stuff for us.
Can I ask somebody else speak in the mic? No. Okay. All right. Let's let's give Chinanaya. I mean, he's been very important this session. And is what we talked about cross-cutting issues in terms of 